Hello, everybody. My name is Pablo Wojcicki. I am a faculty member at Northwestern University and the director of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you so much for joining us for today's weekly virtual seminar of the Center. It is really a pleasure to have you with us. The mission of the Center is to create knowledge about digital media in Latinx and Latin American communities across the Americas. Today's speaker is a leading scholar in this space. Paola Recaurte is an associate professor in the Department of Media and Digital Culture at Instituto Tecnológico de Monterrey and a faculty associate at the Bergman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. Mariana Sanchez, a doctoral candidate at American University and an affiliate of the Center for Latinx Digital Media, will introduce Paola in just a minute. I am delighted to note that this quarter, our series is co-sponsored by the Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities, the Buffett Institute for Global Affairs, the Department of Radio, Television and Film, and the Program in Latin American and Caribbean Studies. But before we go to the seminar, I would like to start by acknowledging that Northwestern is a community of learners situated within a network of historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. It is also in close proximity to an urban Native American community in Chicago and near several tribes in the Midwest. The Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Orawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho Chunk Nations. It was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes, and it is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about native peoples and the institution's history with them. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion, Northwestern works towards building relationships with Native American communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service, and enrollment efforts. Let me say briefly uh, a little bit more about how the seminar will unfold. First, Mariana will tell us more about Paola's research and career in just a minute. Then Paola will present her work. After that, we will open for questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&A function at the webinar at the bottom of the screen. You can enter them at any point in time. Mariana will moderate when Paola finishes her presentation. At the end, we will deliver some closing remarks. Once again, many thanks for joining us. And without further ado, Mariana, the screen is all yours. Thank you so much, Professor Pablo. Okay, it is my pleasure to introduce Pro uh, Professor Paola Ricaurte. And let me tell you a little bit more about Professor Ricarte. She is an associate professor and researcher at the School of Education, Social Sciences and Humanities in the Department of Media and Digital Culture at University Tecnológico de Monterrey. Professor Ricarte studied journalism, gained a master's in Latin American studies and then pursued a PhD in linguistics at Mexico's National School of Anthropology. She is also faculty associate at the Bergman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University and a professor at University Centroamericana in El Salvador. Her research interests include the empirical study on the impact of technology in social life and digital politics and activism. She is co-founder of Tierra Común, a network of academics, practitioners, and activists interested in decolonizing data. She participates in several expert committees, such as the Global Partnership for Artificial Intelligence, the Global Index on Responsible AI, and the Expert Group for the Implementation of the UNESCO Recommendation of the Ethics of Artificial Intelligence. She is a member of the Alliance for Inclusive Algorithms and coordinates the Latin American and Caribbean hub of the Feminist AI Research Network. In addition to her academic work, she participates in civil society initiatives to promote the development of public interest in technologies. Welcome, Professor Recaute. The screen is all yours. Thank you very much, Pablo and Mariana, for this kind and generous introduction. I am super honored to be here um, with you. Um, and I hope this conversation begins. Uh, it's, it's the beginning of, of a longer conversation. So I will begin um, my presentation. Uh, let me, no, it's another one. One second. Um, 
There it is. Um, the title of my presentation is Decolonizing Technology and Toward a Politics of Shared Responsibility. And um, to begin, um, this is like the general structure of the presentation. I will begin with some terms that are frequently used, sometimes interchangeable. And then I will speak about colonization and coloniality. Uh, yeah, I'm missing here one letter. Then uh, about the coloniality of technology. Um, I will continue with uh, the idea of decolonizing and depatricalizing technology. And then I will end with, um, with an idea or, or vision uh, that is called techology. And I will speak more about that. Uh, at the end. So uh, any question or um, yeah, commentary that you uh, have during the, the talk, please send it through I don't know, the, the question and answer um, function. And I hope we can have uh, a very uh, rich conversation after this presentation. So first, um, about the terminology. There are many terms associated with the process of colonization. We, for example, we know that there is the post-colonial framework. We, um, from Latin America, this, this has a different genealogy than the decolonial framework. The decolonial framework emerged in the territory of uh, what we call Latin America or Avia Yala. And uh, of course, there are many critiques um, regarding the, um, the capture of the term by certain um, academics and also uh, by uh, dominant discourses in Western academia. Then uh, there is also the term anti-colonial, which is more of a Fanonian tradition. And what's the difference between decolonial and anti-colonial? Well, of course, uh, the decolonial framework works toward an anti-colonial society and the decolonial uh, framework emphasizes the process, the process of the linking of this uh, coloniality. I will speak more about that. Uh, there are other um, activists and, and human rights defenders and land defenders that, uh, for example, from Brazil, that prefer the use of the term contra-colonial. Uh, I just wanted to put all this uh, together just to make sure that um, there are tensions when we use any of these terms. Uh, but well, I'm going to use the decolonial framework and, and I will explain that later. So the first, um, the first part of the conversation is about what's the different be difference between colonization and uh, this category that was coined by um, uh, Aníbal Quijano, uh, that is coloniality. And uh, first, what is to colonize? Uh, and when we speak about colonization, we usually refer to the historical process uh, where the imperial powers invade territories and uh, this possess the people and, and the resources from those territories. Um, and also, we acknowledge that this process has ended in some territories, like um, maybe in, in many countries of Latin America, but it's also a current process. In the world, we have many countries that are still colonized. So here comes the first tension. This is a process of the past, but this is a process of the present too. And uh, we say that the colony was the beginning of the extractivist logic legitimized by the colonizers' racial superiority. So the decolonial framework is, uh, in certain way, a racial theory, but a racial theory that takes into account the whole process of colonization, not only as a material and uh, a physical uh, process of violence, but also uh, a process in which there are many other 
strategies and mechanisms that legitimized uh, the su superiority of the colonizers. And uh, one of those mechanisms is epistemic dominance or epistemic violence. So when we speak about coloniality, we speak about all these mechanisms, this power and domination mechanisms that are still in place after the colonial process or during the colonial process. So for Quijano, coloniality implies the control over resources, natural resources or common resources, labor, knowledge, institutions, relationships, uh, forms of authority, the body and uh, the territory, and of course, uh, the production of subjectivities. So this term um, or this category is useful because it helps us to distinguish the colonial power relations from colonialisms um, uh, and how these power relations are still in place even after the end of what we call colonialism. So it's important to understand this difference because of course, if we are saying that the colonial process is a process that is maybe ongoing in many uh, geographies around the world, coloniality is a part of this power structure that is used to legitimize that dominance. So uh, the decolonial framework can be understood as an interpretative framework that questions systemic domination. Uh, and also here is one uh, important uh, consideration. The decolonial framework is not only about theory. Uh, the decolonial framework is a political praxis. So when we say that we are um, using the decolonial framework to understand uh, reality, we also need to understand that it's not only about uh, understanding reality and, this, how, and how these power imbalances uh, work or operate, but also what do we do about it? So it's a political uh, plan, it's a political practice. So what's the point of uh, using the colonial framework? It's to help us uh, the linking from these uh, power structures. Uh, so I was referring at the beginning to the process of the linking. It's a process that is of course ongoing. It's not easy, um, but it should lead us to the rupture, rejection, and separation of the dominant logic that excludes all alternative forms of being, thinking, feeling, doing, and living. In other words, the ways of alternative ways of understanding the world. So a second critique of the decolonial framework comes from um, the feminist movement in Abya Yala, but also from um, the women's struggle that do not recognize themselves as feminists. So again, um, feminism can be understood uh, from a Western genealogy of thought and practice. Um, and some communities uh, in, in the territory of Abya Yala do not recognize themselves as feminist. And so women's struggles um, contribute to the development of the decolonial framework uh, in the sense that um, they say, well, feminist, we say, <laughs> that it is not possible to decolonize without depatricalizing. Um, and this is a, a phrase from Maria Galindo, a queer activist from Bolivia. And uh, the thing is that the theoretical um, framework developed by the by decolonial academics 
they speak about, as I said, about uh, power relations in terms of uh, sex and, and resources and bodies, but they maybe they do not develop this idea uh, so much. So feminisms uh, in Latin America, communitarian feminisms um, and other feminisms, and also women's struggle that do not recognize themselves as feminists, um, contribute to this idea that we cannot separate how these systems of violence are deeply interconnected. So uh, this is also, for, of, of course, a contribution from intersectional feminism. Um, how, I, I will make here a parenthesis, <laughs> um, intersectional feminism and decolonial feminism contribute each other to the understanding of structural violence, but also how these violence are, um, violence is exerted like transnationally, these power asymmetries and, and, and that are reproduced uh, from one power uh, system to other, or one, um, we can say country or region over others. So we use those frameworks uh, to make this reflection even more, more complex. So I, um, over the past years, I have been working on this idea of the, the coloniality of technology and data and, and also um, particular technologies like artificial intelligence. And um, I will begin this section with a, a quote from Yasnaya Aguilar. Yasnaya Aguilar is one of the most um, relevant voices uh, she, in Mexico. I would say in Latin America. <laughs> she is from the Mije community in Oaxaca. The Mije community, and she always says that uh, she is Mije, which is not uh, the same as indigenous and it's not the same as Indians. She says uh, that the Mije community existed way before the colonization and with the com colonization, they were named Indians. And then with the constitution of states, they were named indigenous people. But uh, she says, I am Mije. I am not what the others uh, want to call us. So Yasnaya has a very uh, deep understanding of the interconnectedness of these um, uh, systems of violence, and in particular, how technologies are used as part of the imposition of a Western model of the world. So uh, here Jasnaya says, it is a myth of the West choosing perpetual economic growth, advancing through a digestive, digestive system of, uh, sorry, uh, uh, excuse me, okay, apologies. Uh, of sorts, one that uses technology as one of its core components. In its turn, ecosystems became goods, people mere consumers. The myth turned the world into a place increasingly inhospitable to human life. So here's the first contribution um, that um, makes clear or makes visible how this Western model of the world is based in values and principles that are contributing to um, the extermination of, the re <laughs> of humanity in general, uh, and also uh, is using natural resources without considering that the environment uh, is um, is closely connected to what we are. So this vision of the world that is shared by many uh, peoples of the continent of Abya Yala is um, is what we call a relational ontology, ontology, and a relational ontology. 
which is uh, different from um, the ontologies that uh, explain uh, existence in, in other um, epistemologies, like the Western epistemologies, basically uh, says that we as human beings are not superior or um, disconnected from uh, the, the environment or other human beings. In, in European uh, theories, this has been called maybe as post-humanism, um, but um, in the continent, um, in Abya Yala, this is the way of uh, consuming the world and living um, that is the, uh, yeah, is, is the cosmovision or the worldview of many of the, the indigenous uh, communities in Abya Yala. So this is this is the way they understand the world. So um, when when I use the decolonial framework, um, I try to explain that this uh, violence, that is a systemic violence, is a structural violence, is linked to uh, the uh, development of technology or hegemonic technologies in our present. So socio-technical violence is a result of the systemic violence and also supports this violence, is a tool to um, reproduce these forms of uh, domination. And again, uh, from as I said, from, from learning from the feminist struggles, we try to emphasize that this uh, systemic violence is an articulation of these macro systems, which are capitalism, colonialism, and the patriarchal order. So the various modes of systemic violence operate through the three epistemic processes of datafication, algorithmization, and automation of the world that seek to appropriate the spheres essential to sustaining life. So, um, Hegemonic technologies are, um, if we look at them uh, and we see what they achieve uh, at the end of, of <laughs> um, they are uh, contributing to reproduce uh, poverty and also this increasing this gap between some countries and other, between some peoples and others. And also uh, this idea of unlimited technological development uh, is causing uh, as well uh, the damage uh, to the planet. So these three processes, let's say, um, let's call them epistemic processes uh, in the first place, uh, produce certain orders of knowledge and social classifications that are not only local, but global. So if we remember how this colonial process began um, with this idea of the colonizers being su superior because of their race and, and also because they were able to think while uh, the colonized people were not able to think or exist because they were not considered humans. Now we have these epistemic operations at a global scale that create these orders of what is good and what is bad, who is, um, whose knowledge is valuable and whose knowledge should be uh, disposable, which bodies uh, are disposable. So for me, these epistemic operations uh, lead to epistemic, economic, social, cultural, and environmental inequalities. So now we have these new mechanisms to legitimate this world order or this vision of the world that is um, violent. So violence is naturalized and institutionalized and mediated uh, social technically. How creating, as I said, these knowledge systems, these systems of authority, uh, who, uh, who is able to decide, who is able to um, 
to govern uh, technologies, for example. Also, these systems mediate our intersubjective relations. And they are anchored in violence uh, to specific, uh, focused on specific bodies and territories. Uh, they need material infrastructures. Um, they need um, material resources. But the question is who's bearing the cost of this uh, hegemonic technological development? And as I said before, one of the contributions of uh, the, yeah, of, of the women's struggles in Abya Yala is the idea of body territory as a unified um, uh, space, uh, a unified uh, conception that we cannot, um, that is, is uh, threatened because uh, these extractive industries associated not only um, with uh, natural resources, but are also anchored in the social technical development. Um, are affecting specific, as I said, specific bodies and territories. And these bodies, we know these bodies are especially women's bodies, racialized bodies, are bodies that are uh, bodies in, in, in mobility, migrants, refugees. So the operation of uh, extraction and extractivism and dispossession is oriented towards these specific bodies and, and territories. Here, I draw this diagram uh, to try to connect all these uh, dimensions, um, the geopolitics of technology, and also um, how this is connected to the body politics, um, going back to this idea of the body and the territory as a unity. So in this case, um, AI technologies, uh, take advantage of this interconnectedness um, using uh, natural resources, uh, water, energy from, uh, uh, from the, the community's environment and also affecting uh, us, our bodies, our feelings, um, the way that we relate to each other. But they are... Uh, again, based in precarious labor, unfair labor, uh, from people that uh, are located in the global south. But all these technologies are part of the social system of relations, regulations, institutions, uh, practices, and also are, of course, part of this whole uh, geopolitics of technology. So, Again, uh, this is another uh, diagram to show this interconnectedness between the body and the territory and how these technologies are um, mediating this, these relationships. So one of the ideas that um, comes from the uh, critical vision of, of technology is that uh, inequalities now are automated. We don't need actors um, like states or companies to be responsible for the effects of the use of technology because these relationships are already automated. So um, as I said, poverty is in increasing and the gap between um, uh, industrialized countries and, and countries that do not have this uh, hegemonic technological development um, is causing death in, 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 in our countries of the global south. Also, uh, this interconnectedness of uh, oppressions, um, as I mentioned before, this extractivism uh, of the natural resources, but associated with precarious labor, and uh, the automation of neoliberal policies, the surveillance of the poor, racism, uh, patriarchy, and other uh, issues like lack of transparency, uh, accountability, or reparation, for example. So who's bearing the cost again? 
of territorial occupation, water, land, air pollution, displacement of communities, labor exploitation, poor health, poor living conditions, this knowledge gap and infrastructural inequality, data extractivism, epistemic erasure, epistemicide, undermined democracy and algorithms, and of course, death. So um, as I said at the beginning, um, in the beginning of, of this session, when we think of uh, the decolonial framework, we should think of it not only as a critical framework to understand reality, but as a political praxis. So that's why we use the verbs, uh, decolonize, depatricalize, um, and what should be decolonized, what should be depatricalized. And uh, probably you already uh, saw that I'm speaking not only about technology, I'm speaking about how all these systems uh, work together. So we need to decolonize the bodies, uh, the ideas of sex and gender that are embedded in social technical systems this uh, surveillance of our bodies and this uh, definition of what gender uh, is. Uh, we also need to decolonize our affections, uh, our desires, because uh, part of the success of this hegemonic technology is the colonization or, of subjectivities, um, as I mentioned uh, earlier. So, what, what are our aspirations, personal and collective aspirations? And, and the response is usually that we put first our individual aspirations because that's part of the model that you have to think about yourself as an individual and not as a collectivity. So that's part uh, of the strategies or the mechanisms to uh, colonize subjectivities. We also have to decolonize narratives. Again, this uh, technical solutionism, uh, this determinism of technology, this idea of what is development and what is modernity, what is uh, desirable for our, our societies, because uh, hegemonic technologies are not sustainable. We don't have one single um, gadget that is sustainable. And that means that the use of technology is um, contributing to this um, ecocide. But again, we uh, part of narratives try to dissociate our uses of technology from the effects and the cost of this technology. We have to decolonize our imaginaries of um, the present, but also uh, our imaginaries of the future. Um, there is also a narrative about the impossibility of escaping this system. Um, we have to decolonize our memories. We have to decolonize our sensibilities, the way that we um, relate to each other. Um, we have to decolonize our body territories. Uh, there is a process of extractivism in, for example, the deforestation of the Amazon that is associated with technological development, destruction of gold, and also um, the process of extraction of lithium in, in our countries um, is also associated with technological development. And we need to decolonize our existences. Um, so, Again, this is another uh, quotation from, from Yasnaya. And uh, she says that we need to think about ourselves in a different way. And we have to learn from the peoples that have been uh, struggling and fighting for alternative visions of the world that are sustainable, that have a different relationship with the environment and with uh, and, and with other uh, beings uh, in the world. So uh, this is the response that she gives, the alternative that can be envisioned from Abya Yala lies in disengaging economic development and the use of new technologies 
uh, from the concept of merchandise and putting technological creation and inventiveness back at the service of the common good and not the market. Technology seen as techio, technological creation as a common good and open source in which we can participate just as we have participated in the construction of our lives in the colonized people of the continent resisting genocide and disappearance. In the face of the current climate emergency, it is necessary to rethink a technological development that emphasizes dignified life and not infinite economic growth as an end in itself to bet on technologies based on collaborative work rather than on competition. The peoples of Abia Yala have experience in this strategy, one that I have called techology. If the world would only adopt this technological vision, then perhaps we could rescue the creative work of new technology from the clutches of a digestive system that phagocytes and endangers human life. So this is the proposal from the peoples of Abia Yala. Um, and techio is a, is a word in, uh, in Nahuatl that means a communal work, but it has its reference uh, or correlates in different uh, languages in, in Latin America and in the Andean region, it's called Minga or Minca. And in Brazil, it's called Muchirau. I don't, have, I don't speak Portuguese well. Uh, but um, many peoples of, of, the of the continent have this vision of communal, communal work as a way to achieve uh, a goal and also another um, another value that supports this this, this communal work is uh, reciprocity. So technologies are technologies uh, are technologies of autonomy, sovereignty, communality, sustainability, and um, yeah, I already that point. And also, um, I would like to finish just saying that there are many. Um, ideas of a, a alternative ethics uh, that are not art that are not associated with the market or personal um, uh, or a personal view of of existence so uh, Sueli Rolnik a sociologist from Brazil speaks about the ethics of existence um, also from the feminism uh, there are uh, there is this idea of shared responsibility uh, ethics and poetics of radical care, ethics of commonality, ethics of conviviality. So there are many ethics uh, or ethical frameworks that respond to this idea that we cannot exist as, uh, as an individuality, that everything that we do has a consequence on others and uh, on the environment. So the response or the praxis to these ethics could be the development of technologies of care, of conviviality, of commonality, or as Esnaya said, technologies. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. This was a great seminar. Um, <clears throat> I just want to remind everybody that you can post your questions here at the questions and answers uh, tab that we have. And I have a, a question. This has been an amazing conversation, but I, I was wondering, what do, you, what do you suggest that we can do as students, as scholars, as academics, or even activists? How, how shall we start? Or what shall we do about this? Well, the first, uh, yeah, thank you for, for the question. Uh, the first thing I would say, um, is to think critically about these issues and the role that technology plays in um, supporting these systems of violence. Uh, and then uh, embracing a political praxis of how, how can we do in everything, yeah, in everything that relates to, to our lives, how can we connect to each other and, and try to be responsible for uh, the way that we relate to technology, um, but collectively. Uh, so I would say there are many things that we can do and, and the answer is, um, is 
uh, is in your community. So your community together should think what's the best way to achieve a dignified life? How is the best way to achieve the future that we want? Um, and try to pursue that um, common future. Thank you so much. We have another question from Facundo. You want to unmute? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Paulo, if you want to um, let me um, show my uh, camera, I think I don't have. Uh... Oh, yes. All right. Uh, thank you, Paola, very much for this very, um, very important conversation, very enlightening talk in many ways. Um, I'm curious um, about what you said about um, the importance of uh, affect desires. And I will also add, because it's my interest, sexuality and sexual pleasures in, in, in that um, uh, group of uh, of. Uh, words that you that you included, because I'm 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 thinking like more from a Foucaultian, Foucaultian uh, place that like as he reminds remind us that when any time there is any way of like multiple ways of oppression, there's also resistance, right? So I'm I'm curious about how do you see that uh, if it is possible through uh, ethic of care, but also affect and sexuality, if there is any way in which we can resist power there. And also if through um, the lenses of affect and sexuality, is there any way in which we can um, yeah, embrace and foster a decolonial framework? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and I, I always emphasize this idea of the body territory because um, we sometimes forget that there, the first, side of resistance is the body territory. So there is um, there, there are some questions that we should answer um, if we want to connect this idea of, of decolonization uh, to the idea of resistance. I think that um, one of the questions is where does the idea of gender and sexuality comes from? And what this idea, and, and this is also Foucauldian, if we if you want. And 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 how society shapes this idea, and how in this case, uh, technological mediation defines what's your idea of gender and sexuality. I was mentioning uh, in one of the in one of the slides that um We usually are not very aware how technologies are embedded in this construct of sexuality and 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 specific uh, ideas of the body. And we did uh, research with with my students on um, menstrual apps, and we were just so. Um, scared and angry <laughs> of how our bodies are datafied um, in a way that uh, reinforces this idea that our bodies are not ours. Um, so I would just say that the first, for me at least, the first um, yeah, the, the first idea is to challenge these conceptions of the body um, and sexuality and affection that are hegemonic and how these conceptions uh, separate us, separates uh, not us only as, as collectives and collectivities, but also how these ideas Mm, are ideas that are um, based uh, in, in, in violence because 
if if you, for example, one simple thing, if you give your consent to an application and you don't have any other option that is violence. Um, so how this mediation is reinforcing this idea that we have to relate to ourselves and to others through violence instead of affection and care and responsibility for those affections or for what our lives affects or our lives and practices and, and decisions uh, affect others. We published, uh, it's a, I don't know how to call it. It's not a book. Uh, it's a publication that we develop among many uh, hack feminists uh, <laughs> in, in, in Mexico and we call it uh, techno affections because in Spanish, and that's one problem of translation, affections connect uh, what affections like uh, affect what you feel, but also, um, and your sensibilities, uh, but in Spanish, affection can also imply the result of, of your actions. You have a consequence of your action. So we wanted to connect those definitions that in Spanish are, are together, but in English is, is, is hard to explain it. Mm, because we think of, of uh, our relations with technology as techno affections, uh, relation of affection among ourselves, with ourselves, but also the implications of, of that to others and the environment, of course. Thank you. Thank, oh, thank you. We have some questions from uh, the public. Ana Cristina Susina says, thank you, Paola, for this great presentation. I feel that we placed a lot of hope in technology, thinking that it will bring democracy, save the environment, etc. And the way it goes, there is a dystopic picture in front of us. Do you think that we are in this place because we humans spend too much time creating things? If the current, if the current colonial approach, approach to technology is a dystopia, what is your, your Paola's utopia? Hi, Anna. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and of course, we have this dystopian present uh, and we see maybe this dystopian future as well. But my, I would say it's not an utopia. I think I have a faith in humanity and, and special uh, bodies <laughs> and territories that are showing us that another, as, Zapatista, as the Zapatista movement says, another world is possible because they are living in a different way. They are pursuing a, a different future. The thing is that we have to learn or first unlearn <laughs> from these narratives and relearn from our ancestral um, experience. And technologies are not technologies. Technologies are, I would say, uh, relationships. So if we understand technology as, as relationships, and that's another way to contest this idea of, of technology as gadgets. If we understand that technologies are relationships, then we can develop technologies or technologies of care, technologies, uh, as someone says, technologies of radical care. And we can reverse that, um, necropolitics and this necrotechnopolitical uh, discourse. Mm. So I, I, I don't know, I am optimist. I see around many people that are uh, fighting for the future that we deserve. Thank you. We have another question. This one is from Mariana Ferrarelli. Thank you, Paola, for your deep reflection on the present of our technological lives. I find the definition of technologies and Aguilar's developments very enri enriching and illuminating. My question refers to how to address all these issues in the school classroom. Which approach do you suggest to work with all these ideas with primary and secondary school students? 
Thank you for this question. We have a great responsibility with children um, because we maybe as adults, we don't see it, but we are embedded in this um, dystopian discourse uh, that is not helping them imagining that uh, a different world is possible. And children are very sensitive. And I think, at least from my experience as being a, 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 a mother, children are giving answers and are very, um, yeah, they are more critical than we were when we were children. And and I think that we should learn a lot from them, <laughs> but also uh, we should uh, not, we don't have to contribute to this dystopian idea that nothing is possible, that we are, we are not able to disrupt uh, the world in the way it is because we created it. So we can destroy this world, <laughs> this bad world <laughs> or this bad model of the world. Um, so maybe, yeah, maybe I would say, let's think critically about technology. Let's explain and, and think together uh, how these technologies work, well, the role that technologies play in these uh, power relations. And they are super smart. They understand everything. So, and they have more responses that, uh, yeah, that we have. Thank you. We have another question uh, from Professor uh, Manuel Alejandro Guerrero. Congratulations, dear Paola. Yesterday in a workshop with journalists organized by the Inter-American Press Association, I was presenting some examples of working with ChatGPT, the chatbot of OpenAI. And I was stressing the fact that when using this program, journalists should not be blind to the biases the database with which the AI was loaded, mostly Western and masculine. One concrete example was that when I asked ChatGPT to enlist the names of 20 famous scientists of the 21st century, it did so without problem. But when I asked the, to enlist the names of 20 Latin American women scientists, not only it made up names, but inserted even some names of men scientists. Are you and your network thinking about how to approach this issue, how to discuss it with the developers of these technologies? Thank you. Yeah. The the chat GPT thing is <laughs> now in the agenda, in the global agenda, not only um, uh, yeah, in, in, in our local agendas. Um, and it has several impacts. Of course, there are these biases. I found many ideological biases as well that are super concerning. Um, but there are also other issues associated with the use of Chat GPT, not only in schools, that was one of the first concerns, uh, but also we had a recent case that uh, in, in Colombia where a judge used Chat GPT for a sentence um, that was against uh, children with disabilities. So the question is for us, journalists, academics, teachers, uh, the judiciary system, do we understand the implications um, of automating? Again, that, that's why I use this idea of automation, well, it's Ziegler's idea, um, this idea of, of automating society, because again, who's responsible for that? The developers, the users, states that are not regulating the use of these technologies in like preserving human rights or data, uh, I don't know. So for me, the question is, as society, we need, we need to speak about the implications of the use of these technologies. These technologies, and unfortunately today, we had a, a, a session uh, where a person from the government was saying, technologies are neutral. Technologies are not bad. <laughs> so we are fighting those narratives about technology being neutral. It's not neutral at all. So it has implications. And usually those implications are for, 
again, women, children, uh, uh, racialized people, uh, people, uh, bodies in mobility. Uh, so uh, we need to fight against that idea of, of neutrality. Uh, we need to uh, make visible these, not only biases, uh, but these multiple harms when we use these technologies without any um, constraint. Thank you. We have one more question from Doris Milda Flores Marquez. Thank you, Paola. Happy to learn from you. In the face of colonization, there is always resistance. Can you tell us more about the resistances you identify in practical act activist, but also academic terms? Well, academia has also been sustained by colonizing logistics. <laughs> Hola, Doris, gracias. Um, yes, a university is a uh, uh, an institution that was um, built as part of this colonial process. As I said before, the creation of institution is fundamental in the creation of knowledge is fundamental to reproduce uh, coloniality. So how do we fight against that? Uh, I think, well, you do many things. <laughs> we have to work together with our students we have to reflect uh, on the use of the technologies that we use, the implications of the use of, of these technologies. And, and I'm, um, again, uh, there are many examples in, in Navia Yala and other regions of how people resist organizing, um, disrupting, uh, opposing the government because political development also is um, under the, um, global policies, but also local policies that um, are associated with this narrative of innovation and investment and, and development. So there are many ways in which critical thinking uh, contributes to dismantling these narratives, these practices, and hopefully these infrastructures. So I, I think that we should keep uh, promoting critical thinking, critical frameworks to unveil this, um, as I said, the interconnectedness of this, these systems of violence. Thank you, Paola. This is exactly what we need to be doing. So thank you very much for reminding us of that. Thank you, Mariana, for phenomenal moderation, as always. Uh, thank you again, Paola. The talk was very, very inspiring and most needed. Um, and I want to thank our audience for staying with us through the end for terrific questions. And I want to invite uh, all of you to join us uh, next Thursday for the next installment of this virtual seminar series. Once again, Paola, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now. <laughs>